Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Tools for Telling Your Coalition Story. My name is Kelsey Allen. I'm the Manager of Community Initiatives at Eat Smart Move More South Carolina. Today we are joined by two presenters, Dr. Kelly Kennison and Leslie Leak at the University of South Carolina's Core for Applied Research and Evaluation. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Kennison and Leslie over the past several years, um, and they have guided our evaluation of coalition-led healthy eating and active living work um, and taught us a great deal about how to measure the impact of this work. So we're excited to have them and we will start by hearing from Dr. Kennison. Thanks, Kelsey. It's our pleasure to be here with you today and share a little bit of what we've learned over the past many years of working with Eat Smart Move More South Carolina. Uh, today, we will be sharing five uh, tools, which honestly can be used in a wide variety of ways. We are just going to give you a couple of uh, suggestions on how you might use them, um, but we are available and interested in helping you think through um, how you might adapt these for your use as well. Uh, you can reach out to Kelsey and she can share our contact information, uh, but don't hesitate to get in touch. Next slide. These are our objectives. Again, um, we will be sharing five tools um, and also give, uh, sharing an idea for how you can pull all this information together to really um, have a one page summary um, that you can share with funders and other folks. Um, but again, we want you to think creatively as you uh, view this webinar and think about how you might use these tools. Just um, are using our examples as kind of a launch pad. Next slide, please. The first three tools that I'm going to discuss with you really focus on assessing uh, your coalition's capacity to create community change or perhaps helping your coalition move forward um, in your work to community. Uh, for creating community change. Uh, these three tools are the community sectors inventory, um, an adaptation of the use of SWOT analysis, or SWOT analysis, and peer interviews. The community sectors inventory is probably one of the simplest tools to use, but it can be incredibly powerful. Um, it is, it's essentially a table uh, that you uh, create in um, Microsoft Word uh, to see who is at the table and perhaps even more importantly, who is not at the table. Next slide. Here's an example of the table. Uh, again, this is one that we've used, um, but it could be adapted uh, to more um, appropriately reflect your coalition or your community. Um, and you can do this um, <laughs> by yourself. Uh, you can take a look at your minutes um, from your past several meetings and you can see who is reflected, but probably more powerfully, this could be done at a coalition meeting. It wouldn't take very long. Uh, you could uh, do this, um, either have a large um, version of this um, that everyone could see and you could fill it out together. Um, and just in case somebody who regularly participates is absent that day, be sure to but to look back um, and see if somebody who is a regular participant um, is not attending. Uh, so this helps you see who's there, who's not maybe who coming, um, and who else might you want to involve. Um, and it's very quick and easy uh, to do this. I will share an example of how a coalition uh, used this particular simple tool um, to really make a big change in their community. Uh, this coalition was working um, in many different arenas, but one of the things that they were working on um, was expanding and actually relocating their farmer's market. 
Um, during that time, they were actually decided to use this tool, see who is at the table, and they realized they didn't actually have anyone re representing the disability community at the table. Um, they quickly uh, reached out and a new member of the coalition joined. Uh, and at her very first meeting, um, when they were talking about the farmer's market, uh, uh, the very proud um, farmer's market manager was talking about the relocation location and everything that was going on and she said I love our farmers market but I'm no longer able to take my daughter in there because she's in a wheelchair this was something that nobody really had recognized um, and the coalition uh, well actually the the farmer market manager with the assistance of the coalition really moved quickly in order to make sure that that the farmers market was accessible for all next slide Another tool that you may or may not be familiar with, but it's actually one of my favorite tools because you can use this in so many different ways. Uh, you can use it um, with your coalition, you can use it personally, um, you can use it with organizations, uh, other organizations that you're members of, um, and it's so simple but so powerful. Um, I like to think of it as just a really helpful brainstorming tool. Um, so so if your coalition is maybe new and you want to, you, you know you want to figure out what direction you want to move forward in or maybe what would be the most appropriate um, policy systems or environmental change to pursue um, this would be a great tool or maybe your coalition is just at a point where maybe they've just added several members um, and want to st start out uh, thinking about some different options or different ways uh, that they might move forward maybe some some new new uh, projects that they could do. Um, or maybe there's a funding opportunity. Maybe a coalition um, has learned of a mini grant um, funding opportunity and wants to figure out. Um, again, this can be used in a wide variety of ways. Next slide. Uh, traditionally, the SWOT analysis um, has looked at strengths and weaknesses as internal to the organization or the coalition in this case, um, and then looked at opportunities and threats, which are generally considered to be external. Um, and, I, and most people are familiar with what might be coalition strengths or coalition weaknesses, but I do want to highlight, um, in case you're having a hard time thinking, well, what would be opportunities? What would be threats? Well, um, currently, um, in, we are in a global pandemic, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. That is, that is certainly um, a possible threat um, to a coalition's current work. Um, but there are all, many times things going, at, going on um, at the local level um, that your coalition may be aware of, um, at the state level, at the national level, or in this case, at the international level. Um, and then there may be opportunities. Um, maybe there's a funding opportunity coming up. Um, maybe there are other things going on in the community um, that make it a really good time um, to do a particular activity. But this is a way to systematically um, figure, you know, collect that information. And you can do this in a wide variety of ways. Um, one quick and easy way is to take a coalition meeting, hand out sticky notes um, <laughs> to everybody, and ask them first to brainstorm everything they can think of that would be a coalition strength. Then ask them on sticky notes to brainstorm everything that would be a weakness. Um, what are current opportunities um, at, you know, at the various levels and what are threats? And then they can actually group those, um, it, have everyone just stand up and you can, you know, designate a place where here are the coalition strengths and there will likely be some overlaps or some similar thoughts um, weaknesses um, and then opportunities and threats and you can very easily have a great conversation about all of these um, in a very quick uh, way but I do really encourage you to give everyone um, a 
an initial chance to jot down their own thoughts. Um, not all of us um, are really comfortable speaking up in groups, and this makes sure that you take advantage of those quieter people, um, as well as your more vocal um, participants in your coalition. So I do want to stress that that having time for everyone to think and just jot down their ideas first is really an important part of that. But then actually, once everyone has done that, giving the, them the chance uh, to share those and uh, for a discussion to happen. Um, I also think that another way to do this um, is to actually interview stakeholders. Um, and that's an opportunity to um, build relationships that are certainly important for coalitions, um, as well as to get to perhaps engage a stakeholder in a project that you're working on. Um, but asking, it's very important too to, to find out what what others not involved in your coalition know about the coalition. So it can be used to recruit new members, it can be used to build relationships, but probably most importantly, doing this and asking the questions, you know, in, of others not involved um, in the coalition is an opportunity to find out which, what the impression of um, about, the, about the coalition and the coalition coalition's work is. Um, so those are just two ways. Again, you can use this just personally um, as you're, you know, for yourself, uh, but it's a great tool and I encourage you to think creatively. There's also a wealth of information if you just um, use your favorite search engine, for instance, Google, um, and see how you might, um, there's just all kinds of information out there about SWOT analysis. Next slide. The last tool that I want to share with you is peer interviews. Um, and that's really <laughs> just kind of a fancy name for um, sitting down in a structured way and having a chat with somebody who's in a similar position. Uh, we have used this um, and in collecting information about coalitions. We've actually had um, coalition members from one coalition talk to a, a coalition members in another coalition. Um, we've actually provided the questions, but they've had the conversation and then reported that back to us. Worked really well, but what, what really worked well about that was not so much I mean, the information we got was really fantastic, but it really helped build those relationships. And then the coalitions benefited um, by learning from each other. Um, so uh, this, again, is a tool that could be used in a wide variety of ways, um, but that is just one way uh, that we have used it. And next slide, please. Here's an example um, of a Community Coalition Peer Interview Guide. Um, you could reach out to Eat Smart and Move More South Carolina staff um, if you want to connect with another coalition, maybe uh, a coalition chair or members who are in a similar position. And then um, either they could help you or you could reach out to us. We can help you brainstorm some questions, but here's a way to start. Um, so this is, um, this is available, Kelsey will share at the end of the webinar where you can access uh, these uh, draft tools uh, that you are welcome to take and adapt or contact us and we'll help you adapt them. Um, but this is also another great idea for new coalitions. Um, if your coalition is just getting started, Eat Smart and Move More South Carolina staff can link you with perhaps a little bit more um, established coalition and um, connect you and maybe um, the coalition chair and maybe one or two key members um, could be paired with other with their counterparts in the other more experienced coalition and you'd be amazed but they will also learn from you um, so this is a two-way street um, i just am a big believer in reaching out to people and um, i like to have a discussion guide to give the discussion some framework but my experience is these 
these relationships and these discussions usually go far beyond this structure, but this gives people a place to start. Um, this also might be a good idea for a coalition that is feeling stuck. Maybe um, you just start have run out of ideas or you just are just not sure what project you want to engage in next. Um, reach again, reaching out to East Smart Move More South Carolina staff, connect, having them connect you with a, a another coalition and learning from them. But again, this is a two-way street. They will learn from you as well. Now I would like to turn it over to Leslie Lee on our team. Uh, and she's gonna talk to you a little bit about how you might go about measuring um, coalition impact. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so like Kelly mentioned, I'm going to just share a couple of tools um, for measuring the impact that a policy system or environmental change has on your community. Um, measuring your impact on the community tells you whether or not you're reaching the people that you want to be reaching and how, if at all, your project is affecting their lives. Measuring impact also tells funders that you're a good steward of their dollars and that you have the capacity to implement effective projects. So I'll share today just two tools. Um, the first will be measuring reach and the second will be using community stakeholder interviews to measure your broader impact. So reach is just what it sounds like. It's the number of people reached by your project or your intervention. And this might be the number of people who use a new walking trail or buy produce at a farmer's market or the number of employees in a business with a new corporate wellness policy. And it's important to measure your reach to ensure that your project is being accessed by your target population. Once you know who your project is reaching, then you can start to evaluate the impact that your project is having on their behavior or their lifestyle. So how might you measure reach? Well, really your strategy for measuring reach is gonna depend on the project. But in general, you'll want to take some kind of baseline measurement and then re-measure participation or reach or usage continually through the project. And we're going to go through some specific examples for how you could measure reach for different types of projects. But first, I just want to share some general guidelines that I've picked up over the years. So I always find it very helpful to start with your goal because your goal is going to tell you exactly what you need to measure. Also, you should start with a baseline measurement. Understanding what the community was like before your project is really the only way to know if things changed after your project. And in some cases, your baseline reach is going to be zero because baseline happens before your project starts, but that isn't always the case. Sometimes your PSE change might build on existing work, or in other words, it might build on the existing reach that you have in a community. And then finally, keep excellent records. So develop an organized and systematic way to track use or attendance or reach. And also just think outside the box about what could be used as data. So let's look at a couple of examples now. In example one, let's say that a church builds a community garden in a nearby neighborhood and they plan to distribute produce from that garden to families in the neighborhood. They're gonna start distribution, let's just say June 15th and distribute boxes monthly. So to get started, let's go back to the goal. And a project could have multiple goals, but just to keep things simple in this example, let's say that the goal here is to provide fresh produce to families in this neighborhood. This goal gives us clues about what we're going to measure. In this case, produce is the what, families are the who, and the neighborhood is the where. So our reach would be the number of families in the neighborhood receiving produce. And in order to know reach and ultimately the impact of your project, you have to understand baseline or the conditions of your project or the conditions of, let's say, the setting or the community before your project is implemented. And so in this example, our baseline reach is going to be zero because zero families are receiving produce from the gardens before the distribution. 
but it could be helpful in this case to collect a little bit of baseline data about what we'll call your potential reach. So for example, it might be helpful to know how many families live in the neighborhood. And if you don't have access to that data, um, you could use some online resources to maybe calculate the population density within a one or two or five mile radius of the distribution site. And so these numbers will tell you about your potential reach or how many people you could potentially serve through your produce distribution. And these numbers will help you figure out what percentage of the neighborhood you're reaching once the distribution starts. And so we're just going to dive into these numbers a little bit more. And this table shows a very simple way of collecting the data that you might need to track over time. And remember, if your project starts June 15th, then you'll need to collect baseline data for each of your variables during the month or even the months leading up to the start. Again, in this example, our baseline reach is zero, but remember, this won't always be the case. Also, there's a lot of nuances when you consider your reach. You can see on this table that there are three different measures of reach just in this example. Um, so for example, the total number of unique families in the neighborhood receiving produce could be a measure of reach, or maybe the total number of individuals receiving produce. Um, you could also measure the average number of boxes distributed each month, uh, or maybe you consider the population of the neighborhood, which now has access to fresh fruits and vegetables that it didn't previously have. Um, and this is where our third tip, keeping excellent records, can be really helpful. So entering the number of produce boxes given away on distribution day into a spreadsheet or into a table like the one we just showed, that's a very simple and effective way to measure your reach. But you could have an even better idea of reach if you, for example, had a sign-up form on distribution day, because then in addition to the number of boxes distributed, you'd know the number of unique families that you served. And it could be even better if maybe you had new families complete like a sign up registration form with some simple information like how many members are in their household. That information tells you not only the number of unique families that you're serving, but the number of unique individuals that you're reaching as well. Which measures that you ultimately choose to use to measure your reach is up to you and the data that you have access to. But one final thing that I'll mention here is that maybe you think broadly about what data you actually have access to. Taking headcounts or counting boxes, tracking numbers in spreadsheets, that kind of thing is extremely helpful. But even things like taking pictures during the distribution or keeping track of your receipts or saving email exchanges can all be data depending on what you're trying to measure. So we'll look at just one more quick example. Let's say that you're part of a coalition and your coalition is beautifying a city park to encourage residents of all ages to use it for physical activity. Your coalition hosts, let's say a park cleanup, they repaint the basketball courts, they fix broken swings, and you clear away brush from the existing walking path. But how do you know if all of your hard work leads to more people using the park? So in this example, our goal is to encourage residents of all ages to use the park for physical activity. So this is what we'll try to measure. In order to measure reach, you might wanna ask some questions like how many people are using the park each day? Who is using the park and therefore who is not using the park? How is the park being used? These questions will help you understand your reach. Um, and you could answer these questions in many, many different ways. And I'm just gonna throw some suggestions out there now. Um, one way you could answer these questions would be to uh, make some observations. So you could go to the park, um, ideally at different times of day, on different days, and just observe who is using the park and how they're using it. 
You could also do um, what's called an intercept survey, which would mean that you'd go to the park one day and you would just survey anyone who comes by to use the park to ask them a little bit of information about who they are, maybe how often they come to the park and what they mostly use it for. And one final way you might collect the same information is to send out either a digital or a paper survey to residents and ask them the same questions. And remember, if you want to know if people um, are more likely or more people are using the park after your initiative or your beautification in this case, then you'll have to measure baseline. So you'll have to know who's using the park and how before the beautification. And just remember, uh, the third tip is to keep excellent records. So in this case, that might look like taking detailed notes during any observations that you do, um, the same with any surveys that you do. You could also consider um, taking pictures of the park on different days, of course, with people's permission. This might mean um, saving any newspaper clippings about the park beautification or any videos or social media posts shared, that kind of thing. And so tracking reach is an important step towards understanding your project's broader impact in the community. But there are other levels of impact to consider. And that's where something like community stakeholder interviews could be helpful. So community stakeholder interviews, again, they're a lot like what they sound. They're semi-structured interviews with people in the community that just have a stake in what you're doing. Um, these interviews are, are great. They're one of my favorite kind of resources in the evaluation toolkit because they check a lot of boxes at once. They're great because they help you answer the questions that you need answered, but they also give you your community's perspective. And they're a way to foster a relationship with your community members because they're giving your community a voice. Yeah, we can keep going. Stakeholder interviews can be done either in person or over the phone. Um, and it's always nice to either take very detailed notes during an interview or get permission to record the interview so that you can go back and listen to it. So you'll want to thoughtfully create a list of questions and that will be your interview guide. And there's an example guide here on the screen. And as Kelly mentioned, um, you can always reach out to us if you need help adapting an interview guide for your specific needs. Your interview questions are gonna change based on who you're interviewing. But if we consider the second example um, where you're beautifying a city park, in that case, you might want to interview the city park director. And of course, you'll want to ask them if they've noticed any change in how the park is being used. But you'll also want to ask them questions um, about how the, the, the project or the beautification has changed anything for their organization. So, for example, um, maybe you want to know if they've invested any additional resources into the park. Or are there any new events that are happening because the park has been upgraded? Did any new clubs or teams develop as a result of the work that your coalition did? Maybe you want to know, does the city park um, want to partner with you or your coalition on any new projects? And you can always use interviews, too, to learn about any challenges that your community is still facing or any suggestions that they have for further improvements. Community stakeholder interviews help you kind of see the broader impact of your PSE change on the community. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kelsey to wrap us up. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so like Leslie and Kelly both shared um, great ways to gather information and data that can be used to tell the story of the work that your coalition is doing. Um, and so what I wanna talk a little bit about is how do you take that and share it in a way that is meaningful to both funders and to the community? So one of those ways is to highlight your big numbers. So PSE work can be sort of tricky. Sometimes um, you spend hours and hours and sometimes a year or years working on 
getting a policy change. And so saying we passed one policy um, doesn't always paint the picture of just how meaningful and how big of a deal that is. And so using some of the data that, um, that Kelly and Leslie mentioned that really show especially the reach of that one policy might have and really highlighting that um, is really impactful. And secondly, um, it's important to not solely rely on anecdotes to tell the, the story of your work, but they are such a useful tool and such a valuable way to share the work that you're doing. Um, a success story can provide context that's really important to our work. So saying that we improved one park um, doesn't give you all of the information to really understand how valuable that is to the community. But if you tell a success story that includes, um, let's say a woman and her children who live in that area, uh, and they can tell you that this one park is their only safe place within walking distance um, to be active and have the opportunity to play, um, that tells us the context of your community and the people behind and the heart behind the work that you're doing. Um, you can also use the data that you collect and the evaluation tools um, to demonstrate your capacity to steward funding. So um, evaluation is something that can sometimes be left to, we'll get to that later, or we'll, we will evaluate when we're done. Um, but it's really important to prioritize evaluation and collecting good data um, on the front end because this is the way that we demonstrate to funders that we uh, used their money well, invested it well, and created measurable outcomes. Um, so just keeping that in mind as well, oftentimes meaningful evaluation at the end starts with good planning on the front end, uh, collecting baseline data, identifying people along the way that you're going to want to interview um, for success stories and key informant interviews as well. And then lastly, demonstrating both the health and economic impact of your work. So um, we're gonna talk in a minute about leveraging funds, but there is so much value to this work that goes beyond just the health of our community and community members and our state's health, but it also has an economic impact and being able to communicate that with our community, with decision makers and local leaders um, just helps generate support for the work that we're doing in communities. So this is an example of one of the ways that you might organize the data that you've collected and the evaluation that you've done into a, um, a graphic or into a one pager that you can share with your community, you can share with um, local elected officials and leaders, decision makers, and also to give back to your funders. Um, so you can put on the top there, we shared some contextual information about the community um, and then who is at the table. So sharing information about your coalition, who are the people at the table and the partners that um, you have worked with to be successful. Um, and then on the bottom there, um, funds leverage. So we strongly recommend, this is something we've learned over the years, um, just that any financial investment that you have from a grant or a local partner, um, oftentimes that investment will lead to um, other community members or organizations or funders stepping up to contribute as well. So sometimes a mini grant or a little bit of funding for a community garden um, helps you to go, to go to your local hardware store and say, hey, we're building a garden, would you be willing to donate? Um, and that's something that people can get on board with and donate their resources and time to. Um, and keeping track of what you leverage, that's something you can report back to your funder to show, hey, you invested $5,000 in me and I'm my organization and we were able to leverage that for this many dollars. So your investment yielded this much leverage funds. Um, and that shows your funder just that you did steward their money well. Um, and you used it to just expand the impact and the potential of, of their investment. Um, and then the why. Um, it is important, it's not just to check off the box. A lot of funders do have requirements on evaluation, but um, 
it is so valuable to be good record keepers and good evaluators of the work that you're doing, um, even if it's not required by your funder, but just to have the practice of uh, taking the time to incorporate evaluation and some of these tools into your work um, because it does help you to leverage funding and it helps you in applying for grants to be able to say, this is the time and energy we've put into, um, we've devoted to healthy eating and active living in our community and this is what we've yielded. We have some concrete numbers to show you, we have interviews to, to share with you um, and that really does help in applying for grants. Um, and like I said, often it is a required part of funding. So even if you don't have a grant right now that's requiring it of you, would strongly encourage you to take advantage of some of these tools that are out there and start to get into the practice of, of measuring the impact of your work. Um, and then lastly, for strategic planning, some of the tools that um, especially Kelly mentioned um, are things that you can use internally to help sort of guide the direction of your work, um, to see what's working and what's not working along the way um, and be able to change direction. So these are all really valuable tools um, and a great way to, to measure what you're doing. And then lastly, I'll just say that um, we've been really fortunate in working with coalitions to be able to share back with them uh, the data that they've collected and the impact of the work of the work that they have and being able to as a coalition look back and have concrete numbers and um, measurements to say yes we didn't just put in the hours but but we can we can share this one pager we can share these things um, amongst ourselves and amongst our community to show just how impactful and and important and meaningful this work is so um, it it is and can sound intimidating to work on evaluation, but it is so valuable. And I hope that some of the tools that were shared today um, have mitigated some of that intimidation and made you realize that um, it is very doable and we're here to support you and help you. So thank you so much for listening today and for being a part of this webinar. And thank you to Kelly and Leslie for sharing their expertise with us. Like they mentioned, there's been um, great tools and resources shared. You can find all of them at eatsmartmovemoresc.org. Um, and the options for action section will have this webinar archived as well as um, all of the tools that were mentioned um, earlier in the presentation. For further information, you can always reach out to me. My email is kelsey at eatsmartmovemoresc.org. Um, thank you for your time and um, Best of luck in all that you do.